This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Kirby Anderson is a professor, author, and host of the Point of View radio show. His research with Probe Ministries reveals some startling revelations about the worldview of the church. What I want to ask is, is we see this decline. Do we see it, uh, uh, a parallel in, uh, increase in, uh, I want to say, a tax on Christianity, but, but uh, yeah, it's a tax on Christianity. Uh, at least, you know, talking about Christianity as a myth and, and the uh, national media, different areas. Uh, do you see a parallel increase in that, or has that just kind of been steady and people have accepted it? Is that going to increase as we continue to de decline? Well, and I think you would have to say that if you look at the culture wars that have been taking mm -hmm. place, um, there's been a sense in which the culture wars have been a mismatch almost since the beginning, because you're starting to see that as more and more people are connected to the culture, they tend to have more of a worldly view. And we are admonished in Scripture to actually not be conformed to this culture. Right but be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Christ Jesus. And I think it starts, first of all, with a view of truth. Mm -hmm. We used to believe with, uh, in truth with a capital T. Today, we believe in a post-truth culture. If there's anything we believe has a capital T, it's the word tolerance, and you've run into that. So when you yeah. start with the idea that there is no truth, then anybody that comes into your culture that starts saying, well, I believe that this is true, not only for me, but for you too. Well, then that leads to the next issue, and that is you are perceived as intolerant. intolerant. And people do not want to be called yeah. intolerant. But then eventually intolerance leads to, well, your request is even dangerous. You want to counsel people out of particular kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. You want to challenge them uh, on issues of sexual orientation, transgenderism, or whatever it might be. And so then you move from not only the fact that you are sort of intolerant, but you're really dangerous and maybe even the desire that you want to marginalize those individuals. So I think it's going to be really important, Bob, in this 21st century to know how to make the case biblically. Uh, there have been times when on the, in the past where I would speak on college campuses that when I would be speaking to a group or doing a debate, um, the students at the end were surprised. They said, I thought you'd start out by talking about Bible verses. And I said, well, just think about this for just a minute. If you look at the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul was in a synagogue in Acts 13, could he assume everybody believed the Old Testament? Sure. Did they believe in a one coming Messiah and one God? Sure. When he's in Acts 17, He's in Mars Hill. Can he assume any of that? No, he can't assume that they believed in one God because he's talking about statues to unknown gods and multiple gods. Did they believe in a, who Jesus was? They didn't know who that was. They didn't know who the Messiah was. I said, now, as you students are hearing this, is your particular group of fellow classmates, are they more like Acts 17 or more like Acts 13. Well, oh, it's more like that. And I said, so you have to start where they are. You have to make a compelling case. So uh, this is why we spend so much time both at po Probe Ministries, even on the radio show Point of View, to give you kind of common sense arguments so that whether you're talking to a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you're talking to someone who is a, a Protestant, Catholic, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, these are still common sense kind of arguments. Now, oftentimes when I would do a debate or I'd do give a presentation at the end, I would come to biblical principles, but I would be arguing to my biblical convictions rather than arguing from my biblical convictions. And I'm not just playing with prepositions there. I think it's really important. And so as this culture perceives Christians as being intolerant, as we believe that maybe they're actually possibly dangerous, it's going to be more important for uh, them to see that we are using arguments that make sense to them and using stories and illustrations that maybe touch their heart, maybe even bypass their head that sometimes is very critical of some of these ideas. Is there any way to turn that, that, that battle around? I mean, we're, we're being inundated with the anti-Christian view on social media and, and uh, throughout the Internet. Where do we turn that around? How, how can we do that? Is, is this, well, does it start in the pulpit? Yeah, it's going yeah, to start in the pulpit. So if it was important to have discernment in the first century, 
it's even more important to have discernment in the 21st century. Oftentimes, we even refer to those individuals who don't have a biblical worldview as captive Christians. Now, we pull that from Colossians 2.8, which tells us that we should never be taken captive by mm-hmm. false philosophy. And we say that a lot of people today have become captive to the false views. And it's easy to understand, because, Bob, sure. think about this. The argument is, is that, you know, these phones um, dominate the lives of these younger generation, sure. not to mention Absolutely. the older generation, yeah. too. And that means that they probably spend about eight hours a day in front of a screen. Well, eight times seven, that's more than 50 hours a week, and you've got to counteract that with a 45-minute sermon, (laughs) guess who wins, or even a two-hour youth group. So that's going to require Christians, first of all, to be discerning about what they see, what they read, and what they hear. It's going to require parents and pastors to say, you know, maybe it's a little bit uh, worth uh, spending less time in front of this uh, particular Mm -hmm. screen more time in front of God's Word or more time in front of books and other things. It's going to be, I think, a real challenge for us in the 21st century because, indeed, we have these devices, these digital devices that do intrude into our world. But you might say, well, what chance do we have of success? I can point to you right now some really talented young people that we have each year coming to our Pro Mind Games camp, which is to prepare young, prepare young people before they go off to college. We on this radio studio I'm in right now have a millennial roundtable. They don't allow old guys like me to join that. (laughs) We bring in millennials that run this, and they are some of the best and the brightest. So the bottom line is what we're starting to see is almost like the culture is doing this. You know, the best and the brightest Christian kids that go to Christian schools or in public schools that have concerned parents, they're still doing very well. They're functionally illiterate. Many times they're biblically illiterate. And then you have this mass that aren't. And so it's going to be, I think, even more important for us to encourage our kids, to encourage our congregation, spend a little less time in front of these screens, a little more time in God's Mm -hmm. word and really spending time learning and applying discernment so that we can understand these false views that are actually raised up against the knowledge of God. And here the Apostle Mm -hmm. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, we tear down those strongholds and lofty thoughts raised up against the knowledge of God because we take every thought captive to the obedience Mm -hmm. of Christ. Do you think what's being preached, I don't want to generalize either, but what's, what's being preached has changed in the last 10, 20 years because of fear of being canceled, fear of whatever it is, fear of people leaving the church. I'm, I'm going to water it down a little bit. I'm not going to hurt somebody. Do you think, and I don't want to generalize, but in, anecdotally, do you think in general uh, that what's being preached is, is, is not as, is, uh, I, I guess I'd say, even as powerful as it was 20 years ago? Yes, and again, there is a reason for that. Uh, there's a couple ways we can get to that. First of all, occasionally I'm allowed as a visiting professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Mm-hmm. It's a conversation we've had there, and I'm sure I've uh, has been invited to other seminaries as well, and I've heard that more than once. So it's not oh. like you're making up something that somebody... Okay, that, <laughs> good. <laughs> I don't want to make pastoral ministries, and I've actually been in the pastoral ministries department, we've talked about in the past. There's another way to get at that and to recognize you just as you are watching uh, various uh, programs online, maybe you uh, watch uh, certain churches in addition to going your own, Mm -hmm. uh, just think how many times words like sin, salvation, um, justification, uh, key words just don't show up anymore. Uh, and then again, the real concern that I've had a lot of pastors tell me face to face that, you know, I'd like to preach on some of these issues, but I just know there are just too many people in the congregation that would be upset if we address those issues. And I've noticed this over the years when I was teaching a doctor of ministry class. Doctor of ministry class is one where you've been to seminary, you've been in church for many years as a pastor, and you come back for the D-Min course. And I have noticed over time how the pronouns have changed. We saw that then with homosexuality. When homosexuality is outside the church, people would uh, talk about homosexuality. By the 1990s, didn't hear so much about that. Now you are probably having very few people even talk about issues like transgenderism or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of see, if you're an old guy like me, 
having taught in some of these seminary classes over time, once it becomes a bigger issue inside the church, a lot of times people say, I shouldn't address it. And then you brought up the other issue. Um, what happens when a pastor addresses the issue and it gets out in the popular culture and they say, you know what, we shouldn't allow that pastor to have airtime mm -hmm. on the local television program or something of that nature because of the cancel culture. And so I recognize it's going to be really important for us yeah. not only to have discernment, but here's the other word I use a lot, we're going to need to have courage. Wow. We're going to have to and yeah. strong for biblical principles because a culture is going to want to cause us to kind of hide our lights, put our light under a bushel, mm -hmm. no longer be the salt and light of the world, and simply focus some of this yeah. in the church but not bring the biblical messages inside and to the culture. Now that, that, that pressure continues to increase. What do you think we're going to do with what's coming from the pulpit? I mean, where do we, where do we change that that tide. Well, one of the things I think is very interesting, Bob, is if you look at some of the very significant megachurches in the evangelical world, you do see a number that really are holding strong. Mm -hmm. And it's almost been uh, an, an argument of faith up until a few years ago that really you don't want to talk about these controversial issues because you'll drive people away. Right. But I think some of these pastors are starting to look around and starting to say, you know what? Actually, if you go to some of these churches that are really pretty good size, so-called mega churches, mm -hmm. many of them are holding strong to biblical ideas. So maybe that will begin to cause people to recognize that at a time when there is so much myth and misinformation, there is so much heresy and apostasy, yeah. um, actually what will draw people back to the church is the preaching of the gospel. Well, do, you, do you see, I mean, from your standpoint, your, your, your viewpoint right now, do you, do you see uh, a lot of power that's, that's resident in, in uh, this younger generation today in the last two, two decades? Do you see a lot of power that's, that's kind of residual there that if it really was harnessed that we really could have a, a new reformation, a, a, a new awakening? Well, again, we have to necessarily harness the enthusiasm that they have mm -hmm. with orthodoxy, and that's the issue. I mean, you think about this. The millennial generation has given us uh, short-term missions, see you at the pole, uh, purity rings, all sorts of things that were out of, uh, of an emotional action. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have youth groups. Uh, there are youth groups around the country where when you uh, say we're going to have a youth leadership gathering, there are all sorts of young people that will gather together in these stadiums, in these various places. But the bottom line, the missing link, Bob, is what we've been talking about here today. Mm -hmm. They certainly have the enthusiasm. They have the desire to make a difference, but they really need to have biblical literacy. So I think it's going to be important to channel that enthusiasm, that zeal, maybe even that courage with biblical orthodoxy. And if that's the case, I think we have another great awakening on the horizon. After the break. Governments were saying, okay, we will give you the security and we will give you the protection that you are asking us to give you. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to ask you to give up some of your freedom. That's coming up next. Our culture is moving away from a biblically based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world.
today's guest felt the desire to write a book where culture and current issues intersect with biblical prophecy. Our guest is author Steve Miller, who says the global economy is a driving force in prophecy. Just a note, Steve is deaf. His wife Becky will be helping me by signing to Steve off camera. And I wanted to say thanks for helping us out with the interview. I'm probably old enough to, I am old enough to remember this. You, you may not be, but back in the 70s, the 1970s, uh, there was a lot of people that were into prophecy and eschatology, predicting the future, telling people when Jesus would return, when the rapture would happen, when the end times are going to start. And that sort of fell out of favor with a lot of, a lot of Christians because people were setting dates and things weren't happening. Uh, how did you get interested today in putting out this book? Uh, well, I think one of the really important things, and I begin the book in this way, is that Christ, when he talked about the end times himself to his disciples, he told us three times that we need to keep watch, be alert, keep watch. And all three times in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, when he talked about keeping watch, he also said, you will not know the day or the hour of my coming. So he made it clear that we're not to set dates. He made it clear that there's no way for us to know when he will come. But the very fact that he encouraged us to keep watch does inform us that we should at least get to know the general season of his coming. And that was the whole subject of what he taught in Matthew chapter 24. We talked about the signs of his return. He gave enough uh, information for us to be able to look at what's going on around us and discern what's going on. And you're right, if we do try to set dates, people will get discouraged, and that's the last thing we want to do. It pushes people away from uh, God. What we need to say is that uh, Christ called us to keep watch and be faithful and do that. So the, uh, the emphasis of writing the book, then, is really to encourage believers that uh, we, we really need to be ready, and at the same time, we need to continue to live our lives as, as Christians. Yes, very much so. Uh, the Greek text behind the words keep watch simply mean ongoing expectancy. We, to have an ongoing expectancy simply means to be ready at all times, uh, as opposed to anticipating a specific point in time. So we ought to have this continual attitude. What's kind of interesting is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul talked about the rapture to the Thessalonians, he said, encourage one another with these words. In other words, conversations about the rapture were an ongoing thing, even in the early church. And so God wants us to live with a sense of expectancy, a sense of excitement about Christ's return. But because we don't know when it's going to happen, we need to be faithful to be doing his work at all times. Well, let, let me read something to our audience here, because this is, I mean, if you don't think this is the news headlines, you're missing the news headlines. It's, uh, it's uh, 2 Timothy 3, it says, But I know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, ha ha haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its powers, and from such people turn away. Does that sound like today's headlines to you? It does sound very much like today. And it's interesting you should pick that passage uh, because the very first three words in that passage are really key. It says men will be lovers of self. And the way that passage is constructed Every single one of those sins or those immoralities that you talked about after lovers of self comes out of that term, lovers of self. So it's kind of like lovers of self is the spring from which the fountain of all those immoralities and all those sins and all that evil springs from. And it's interesting because being lovers of self goes all the way back to what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Mm -hmm. When they ate from the uh, tree, they were essentially saying, God... We love ourselves more than we love you. They put themselves first. And being a lover of self ultimately comes down to selfishness. And James 3.16 says that where we find selfishness, we will find every kind of evil. And as we look around us, we see selfishness is rampant. People think about themselves. 
Uh, self is more important than truth. And that's a very revealing sign to us that, yes, we are indeed drawing close to the last day. Yeah, so you, you have this as, as one of the clues, but you say you've got 12 mega clues, big clues, where you see the culture intersecting with, with, uh, with the, the scriptures. And uh, what, what are some of those mega clues? What, maybe we'll start with what you think is the biggest one right now that you see in, in the culture or in the world uh, uh, political well, scene. The first clue I mentioned in the book is globalism. Mm -hmm. That is a very big one. Globalism, uh, we are becoming a more interconnected world. The internet, social media, uh, technology, communication have all advanced to the point where we've become more networked than ever. We've become more interdependent than ever. And we're also looking at the phenomena of how major corporations like Apple, Tencent, Google, Facebook, tie us all together through their business platforms. So there's a sense in which we no longer identify just as Americans or Canadians or Brazilians or Australians, mm -hmm. but we identify as users of Google or users of Apple or users of a certain bank. So we're used to thinking in terms of being people of a global community. Yeah. But globalism, the reason this is so crucial is the Bible tells us that ultimately in Revelation 13, 7, we're told that the Antichrist will have rule over all people, all nations, all languages. And for that to happen, there has to be a one world government. Mm -hmm. And there are organizations today, like the World Economic Forum, that say the problem with the world is not globalization, the problem is not that we're becoming more network. The problem is that we do not have global governance. And so there's a very strong push for global models of governance where we all work together and we all uh, give up our individual uh, models of governance and instead do it globally. I would say that's one of the biggest ones right now. Yeah, and uh, there may be some people in our audience that don't understand what the World Economic Forum is and Klaus Schwab, who actually founded that. But uh, writing a book after the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, The Great Reset, uh, they meet in this World Economic Forum meets in Davos uh, what, annually, I think. And it is a convergence of people from all over the world who control most of the world's wealth, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Uh, what's interesting about the World Economic Forum, and I want to preface by saying that in the book, I make it clear that I do not point to organizations like the World Economic Forum as being the mm -hmm. path to the Antichrist. We can't predict that. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are several more major changes or revolutions or whatever you want to call them before we make the path to from here to there. But what's interesting is the mentality that the World Economic Forum promotes. I'll read from Klaus Schwab's book. You were just mentioning Klaus Schwab. The World Economic Forum, when COVID-19 hit, they said world governments are too splintered. They're all responding in, to it in different ways. This is not good. And they said, COVID-19 revealed a failure of global governance and leadership. And they jumped on this to say, if we want to achieve a better outcome for the future, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economy, from education to social contracts and working condition. Every country from the United States to China must participate in every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. And if you look at the language there, the word must, mm -hmm. all, every, must, every, must, those all sound like imperatives and like command. So the mentality is we need to work together. We need to be a global community. And because the World Economic Forum doesn't work within borders like the United Nations does, the United Nations works within borders. It works within country. The World Economic Forum transcends all that. And it has very powerful people, very wealthy people, who are the ones who are shaping what they believe our world should do in the future. Yeah, and, and a response to that, I think, was the, the treaty that, uh, that lots of countries were signing with the World Health Organization, which gave them the, uh, the power to go into any country if they, if they declared a pandemic or an endemic, to go into any country over and above that country's government and say, this is what you need to do to fight this, this pandemic or whatever it is. 
including locking people down and, and shutting businesses down. But there was a treaty with the World Health Organization. And I think it came out of this whole mindset of the Great Reset. Yes, you're correct about that. It's interesting. The World Health Organization, the top people in the World Health Organization are connected with the World Economic Forum. And interestingly enough, top people in our own government, top people in other government, top people in high tech company, top people in uh, media, top people in no matter where you look, top people, you weave it all back and you'll find that they share a common mindset. They are part of the World Economic Forum. They all have the mindset that we need to be a global community. Uh, so this does hold a lot of sway. It does hold a lot of power. And it's frightening to think what you were just saying about all the countries of the world yielding their sovereignty on health issues mm -hmm. and saying, World Health Organization, you make all the call. But that's the mentality that's being promoted, not just in health, but now we're looking at the economy. Now we're looking at energy issues. Now we're looking at food issues. Yeah. You, you think, uh, this is kind of an aside, that uh, th a lot of, and I, when I say these people, but a lot of the people involved in these things are really looking for more immortality. They're looking for a way to extend their their, their life or their power that uh, somehow the rest of the world isn't smart enough or strong enough or wealthy enough to do that, but this group of people could maybe become immortal. Do you think <laughs> there's, a, there's an idea in the back of their head that I want to extend my life th by doing these things? You know, I think that's an interesting thought. Uh, it's hard to know where they are mentally. They don't say a lot along those lines. But I think some clues we can look at that fit with what you're suggesting here. One clue is that man has always sought to be immortal. Mm -hmm. Man has sought to overcome death somehow. We've always been looking for ways to extend our lives. And now we're looking at modern technology and even artificial intelligence as possible ways of extending life. And now we're already talking about transhumanism, where we integrate technology in the human body. And you can't help but think what motivates us to investigate artificial intelligence and transhumanism as the answer. The motivation is our desire to be immortal. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.